With the final Starship Block 2 flight just around the corner, SpaceX is eager to move forward to the next major milestone, the Block 3 Starship. However, the big question remains, are they truly ready? A recent issue involving the centerpiece of this new version, the Raptor 3 engine, may raise doubts about whether Block 3 will be ready as soon as hoped. No exaggeration. When it comes to Starship Block 3, the Raptor 3 engine is arguably the most critical upgrade. Not only will both the upper Starship and lower Super Heavy Booster be equipped with it, but this engine alone brings a massive performance boost, an estimated 40-ton increase in payload capacity, raising the fully reusable payload capability to over 100 tons. But that's not all. According to Elon Musk, the Raptor 3 is also a key part of solving several issues observed in many Block 2 flights. It's not just a performance upgrade, it's a reliability upgrade. That said, despite Starship Block 3 being on the verge of readiness, many are concerned that the Raptor 3 might be lagging behind other components in development. So why is that? Most of the Raptor 3 engines built by SpaceX so far are currently undergoing testing at their McGregor facility in Texas. SpaceX has a dedicated area there specifically for Raptor engine development, equipped with multiple test stands, including both horizontal and vertical setups. The horizontal stand allows engines to be tested while lying on their side, while the vertical stand enables full duration firings in an upright position. This dual configuration allows SpaceX to simulate a wide range of real-world conditions, from quick ignition tests to extended burns, all within a controlled and safe environment, far from the launch sites. Raptor engines at McGregor go through rigorous evaluations, including relight tests, long-duration firings, and even stress testing to failure to push the engines to their limits. However, completing these tests at McGregor doesn't mean a Raptor is fully flight-ready. These are individual engine tests. They're not tested as part of an integrated vehicle until they arrive at Starbase. Once at Starbase, Raptors are mounted to a ship or booster and go through integrated testing. For Starship upper stages, this usually happens at the Massey outpost, but right now that's not possible. The entire ship engine test stand at Massey was destroyed during the Ship 36 explosion back in June. When operational, Massey is where static fire tests are done, starting with single-engine burns and recently ramping up to six-engine static fires lasting nearly a minute. Following the Ship 36 incident, SpaceX is taking the opportunity to upgrade and rebuild Massey, which will be critical for testing the upcoming Block 3 vehicles. In the meantime, they're relying on a homemade adapter to conduct some Starship static fires at the orbital launch site, but this is only being used for the remaining Block 2 ships. As for Block 3 vehicles, both ships and boosters equipped with Raptor 3 engines, they'll have to wait until the rebuilt Massey site is ready for integrated testing. Another important point is the status of the Raptor Vacuum, or RVAC, engine. Nearly every Raptor 3 spotted so far has been the sea level version. There was one sighting of a Raptor 3 Vacuum variant, but since then, no additional information has surfaced about SpaceX testing this version. That said, it's unlikely to take SpaceX too much time to bring the RVAC version up to speed. The core machinery is nearly identical to the sea level variant. The main difference is the much larger nozzle. This larger nozzle is necessary because rocket engines behave differently in the vacuum of space compared to within Earth's atmosphere. In vacuum conditions, exhaust gases can expand freely, allowing for greater efficiency. But on Earth, atmospheric pressure pushes inward on the exhaust flow, which can cause something known as flow separation. This is when the exhaust detaches from the nozzle walls, potentially causing damaging vibrations or even structural failure. The Space Shuttle main engines experience similar issues during startup, leading to the iconic wobble seen in many launch videos. To prevent this kind of damage during ground tests, SpaceX installs a bracing ring at the end of the RVAC nozzle. This structural reinforcement helps stabilize the nozzle during ignition, preventing destructive vibrations. With Starship Block 3 set to become the first version of Starship to reach orbit, it's critical that the RVAC engines are thoroughly tested and proven flight ready. Ensuring their performance on the ground is a key step toward making that happen. It's no surprise that getting the Raptor 3 engine ready is taking a lot of time.
This engine uses one of the most complex and difficult combustion cycles in rocketry, the full flow stage combustion cycle. Here's a quick breakdown of just how complicated that is. To start a Raptor engine, you need the propellant pumps to be spinning. But those pumps are driven by turbines, and the turbines are powered by combustion in the pre-burners. But for the pre-burners to work, they need to be supplied with propellants, which are delivered by the very same pumps you're trying to start. It's like a loop. To break that loop, most engines, including Raptor, use a technique called spin start. This involves injecting high-pressure inert gas into the turbines to get them spinning just long enough to start pumping propellant into the system. That kicks off the engine start sequence. As the propellants begin flowing, the fuel and oxidizer meet inside the pre-burners. But combustion doesn't happen immediately. They need to be ignited first. That's where torch igniters come in, which function somewhat like a high-tech lighter. Once ignited, each pre-burner produces a hot, high-pressure gas that flows into the main combustion chamber, where they finally combust together on contact. As propellant flow stabilizes and combustion reaches the right balance, the engine enters what's known as a steady state. At this point, as long as propellant keeps flowing and the engine materials can withstand the heat and pressure, it will keep running. But of course, that's all much easier said than done. The Raptor engine's performance depends on extremely precise control of flow rates, timing, and pressures throughout the system. If one pump runs slightly higher pressure than the other, it can throw off the balance downstream, affecting the entire engine. If the pre-burners ignite even a fraction of a second out of sync, you risk stalling a pump, starving parts of the engine, or overheating components. Even a tiny misstep during startup can destroy the engine. Despite all this, SpaceX is able to start a Raptor engine in just about one second, which is honestly mind-blowing. And every time they roll out a new version, like Raptor 3, it's not just minor tweaks. The upgrades are drastic. Parts are simplified or integrated, new cooling methods are introduced, and unnecessary components are removed. Yes, all of this takes time. There will be test stand failures. But once Raptor 3 is fully operational, it will represent a huge leap forward in both performance and reliability, not just for the engine itself, but for the entire Starship system. Development related to Starship Block 3 is still going on strong at Starbase, for example. Booster 18.3, a Block 3 booster test tank built to validate the structural integrity of the newly integrated hot staging ring. This prototype is currently located at the Massey test site, where it's undergoing both structural and cryogenic testing. Unlike previous designs, this new hot staging ring resembles the truss-style interstages seen in some older Russian rocket families. This structural approach provides support for the upper stage, the ship, without requiring a separate interstage ring to be installed before launch. More importantly, it eliminates the need to jettison and expend the hot staging ring during flight, making the system more reusable and efficient. As part of this redesign, grid fins, which were previously mounted on the interstage, similar to Falcon 9 and earlier Starship boosters, have been relocated to the liquid methane LCH4 tank section of the booster. In addition, the number of grid fins has been reduced from 4 to 3, arranged in a T-shaped configuration. While fewer in number, the new grid fins are approximately 50% larger than those currently in use. This increase in size is intended to provide more robust aerodynamic control during the booster's descent and return to the launch site. At the same time, work on Pad 2 is nearing completion. Recently, numerous tests of its deluge system have been conducted. The design of this system is similar to that of Pad 1, where high-pressure water is expelled through various outlets to suppress heat and sound during launch. However, Pad 2's deluge system features a larger water capacity and is expected to operate at higher pressures. Unlike Pad 1, which releases water only from a steel plate beneath the launch mount, Pad 2's system disperses water from multiple locations, including the two halves of the flame bucket, the ridges above them, the steel plate atop the launch mount, and potentially other areas that will become apparent once the pad is operational. The orbital launch mount at Pad B has also undergone a major redesign compared to Pad A. While Pad A required a water-cooled steel plate beneath the OLM to handle engine exhaust, Pad B features a dedicated flame trench, a reinforced, heat-resistant channel designed to redirect and dissipate exhaust gases during liftoff. This new design reduces thermal stress and is expected to lower the need for post-launch repairs. Other components of the pad, such as the launch tower, have also been undergoing testing. It looks like Pad 2 will be ready first. After that, Booster 18, 
is expected to begin testing, followed by Starship 39. Hopefully, SpaceX can bring all the components together in time for the first Block 3 test flight before the end of the year, with the first orbital attempt likely in early 2026. That same year, we're also expecting the debut of another reusable spacecraft, a space plane. In a statement released on September 29th, NASA officials confirmed that the agency and Sierra Space have agreed to modify their existing contract for the Dream Chaser space plane. According to the statement, after a thorough evaluation, NASA and Sierra Space have mutually agreed to modify the contract as the company determined Dream Chaser development is best served by a free flight demonstration, targeted in late 2026. Sierra Space will continue providing insight to NASA into the development of Dream Chaser, including through the flight demonstration. NASA will provide minimal support through the remainder of the development and the flight demonstration. As part of the modification, NASA is no longer obligated for a specific number of resupply missions. However, the agency may order Dream Chaser resupply flights to the space station from Sierra Space, following a successful free flight as part of its current contract. With the ISS scheduled for deorbit in 2030, the window for Dream Chaser missions to the station is narrowing. However, NASA is actively supporting the development of commercial space stations in low Earth orbit to take over once the ISS is retired. It's possible that Dream Chaser could support one or more of these future stations. In a separate statement released the same day, Sierra Space, spun off from Sierra Nevada Corporation in 2021, highlighted the broader mission potential of Dream Chaser. Company officials emphasized that even if the space plane never reaches the ISS, it remains capable of supporting a wide range of missions in the years ahead. Dream Chaser embodies the future of flexible, reliable space transportation, said Fatih Osman, executive chair of Sierra Space. This transition unlocks a new level of mission adaptability, supporting everything from national security priorities to addressing emerging and existential threats, while positioning us at the forefront of the defense tech sector. In partnership with NASA, we're committed to preserving Dream Chaser's extraordinary potential as a national asset, ensuring it's mission ready for the next era of space innovation.